Okay, well, well thank you, Nikki, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be able to share a space with you and just tell my story. Um, I mean, it's, I guess I'll just start from the beginning and share that, you know, I am formerly incarcerated. I served a little over 20 years in the California Department of Corrections for being complicit in the crime of robbery and murder. Um, what I want to say is that my decision at 20 years old to participate in such heinous crimes uh, came in spite of my upbringing. I was raised in a loving two-parent household. My father was black, my mother is Italian. And I had every opportunity to really succeed in life. Um, you know, I, was, I was lavished with love and support. But my early encounters with racism, um, most notably uh, in the second grade, was the first time that I really got a, a, a taste of what it meant to be different. I was raised in predominantly white communities. And because of things that I had seen and learned about how to respond to embarrassment or uh, being shamed or being uh, perceived as less than others, I began establishing like a belief system, a belief system that said that the way to respond to those things was through violence, through toxic masculinity. I'm sure many of you have heard of that terminology before. And my these, these beliefs began to calcify over time. As I grew up, you know, it was no longer the Smurfs or, or Gilligan's Island that were so appealing to me. It became like the more violent uh, portrayals of what it meant to be a man. And it wasn't just my, uh, you know, my desire to watch these things or to, you know, get involved in karate, but it was also my associations that began to, to follow. I, I had really two different sorts of um, friends throughout elementary school. I had the kids who were from the middle class like me, who on the weekends, you know, they played video games and were often under their parental guidance, uh, uh, the love of parental guidance. And then I had other friends who lived in trailer parks and, you know, they spent their time going down to the local liquor store and stealing candy. So when my mom would ask me like, where do you want to go for the weekend? It, based on these beliefs that I had been forming about what it meant to be tough and what it meant to be a man, uh, I chose to go with the, with the more reckless crowd. And this, this pattern continued all the way in through high school. Uh, when I was 15 years old, we moved from Southern California to a town in Northern California called Redding. And it was at this town that I met uh, what was my best friend. He was two years older than me. Um, and he was everything that I wanted to be. He was kind of the, the tough guy of the school. You know, all the, all the girls wanted to be with him. All the guys wanted to be him. And our friendship was really... Uh, based upon this like mutual usury, like he thought I was cool, I thought he was cool, but we really weren't, we were loyal in the sense that like right or wrong, we had each other's back, but not committed in the sense of like what was really important to us, that we stood for one another in that. So fast forward, by the time I'm 20 years old, I already had, you know, several poor choices. I had gotten kicked out, out of my high school, had to graduate high school from a continuation school. I got kicked out of the military for not following the rules. And my, my friend, uh, who I viewed very much like a big brother, uh, actually was living with me. Now on the surface, you know, I was doing things that it seemed like I was had, getting my act together. I was going to college and I was working part-time, but really beneath the surface, there was still the same you know, distorted perspectives about what it meant to be a man. So one night we're, we're playing video games with another friend of ours and and we hatched this harebrained scheme uh, to rob drug dealers. Like we, the way we were thinking was, you know, we could rob these guys. We know we throw parties, you know, we know guys who are selling drugs, we can rob them and then they can't call the cops so we can, you know, keep the money. Well, you know, naturally when you, when you commit armed robberies, particularly with people who are in already living uh, a criminal lifestyle, then violence is, is uh, often an inevitable outcome. Um, so on the night of December 3rd, 1999, uh, I participated in a robbery where I was in the house where my, and my two co-defendants were in uh, a shootout with our victim and our victim died uh, as a result of the gun wounds. In California, the law is 
the law used to be, it actually changed in 2019, that if you are participating in a felony and you and someone dies in the process, then you yourself are guilty of first degree murder. So on the, on the night of the crime, I actually made it to my parents' home. And what uh, I asked my, my parents was like, well, you know, what am I gonna do? And my dad told me, he said, you know, he always lived by the philosophy, you know, you do the crime, you gotta do the time. You know, he was a hardworking man, worked from dark to dark. And he was, a he was the kind of guy who, who never really complained about much. I mean, I had seen him fall off of horses, break arms, fall out of trees, uh, uh, and never cry. He never cried. But on the day that I surrendered at my parents' house, uh, as the sheriffs, you know, handcuffed me and escorted me down their driveway, at the end of the driveway, there was a, a, a camera crew, there were neighbors gawking, and there was my dad. And he was uh, crying in a way that I had never seen before, heaving sobs, uh, as he recognized, you know, the the terrible choice that his son made and, and the, the pain that was ahead for him. And in that moment, you know, I was 20 years old. I had some understanding, I'm crying myself, and I had some understanding that the choices that I had been making in my life were never just about me. It wasn't just about me. Like the choices I made impacted the people that I loved. So I went to prison and I was sentenced to 26 years to life. Ted and my other co-defendant uh, were, sentenced, were sentenced to 40 years to life as the actual shooters. Now, Ted and I, we were not only close friends in high school, um, I mean, we were literally like family. He actually had graduated high school living under our roof. And when we got to prison, we were exposed to a whole new culture. So we started off on the same yard, uh, a level four, which is maximum security yard. And Ted is white and I housed black, which means that in prison, we're enemies. So confronted with this, uh, and the way, the way that Ted became aware of it was our first vis visit. My family, my mom and dad came to visit me, and his girlfriend, who I actually introduced him to, um, uh, came over and, and gave me a hug when she saw me. Just very natural for friends to, to say, hey, how are you doing? Ted came out and continued his visit with his girlfriend. By the time he got back to his cell, however, his cellmate jam jammed him up or, or you know, got in his face and said, it's all over the yard that your girlfriend is out there uh, hugging up on a black guy. So it was made painfully evident early on that the relationship we had prior to coming to prison had changed um, in some ways. And for the first 10 years of our incarceration, both Ted and I gave ourselves over to this antisocial race-based politic in California prisons. And the amount of conversation that he and I had did not extend beyond the amount of time we've been on this call in seven years that we were on the same yard together. For myself, I, I made the decision, the conscious decision that I wasn't going to continue bringing pain to my family's life. So my dad, before he died, he died in 2002. And one of the last things he told me, because I was throwing myself a pity party about how much more time I had to do in prison. And he told me, he said, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, 24 years, 24 months, 24 days, all you've got is this moment, son. So you've got to make the most of this moment for the rest of your life. And I did the best I could. Uh, I, with my mom's support, I began taking college courses. And I just kind of buried my nose in the books uh, for, the, for the most part. Because at the time, in the early 2000s, the perspective of people who were incarcerated, particularly lifers, was that the only way they'd get out of prison was in a pine box. So there were no programs being made available from the outside. You had to have the, the will yourself and the support from the outside from your family to make something like that happen. Fast forward to 2010, I had worked my way down to a lower level prison um, in Soledad. And as Providence would have it, Ted ended up at the same prison. By this time in his life, he had made a huge transformation himself. He had uh, turned his back on the antisocial, how it is mentality in prison. A, a couple years prior to him getting to Soledad, him and his father actually established a nonprofit organization called CROP. And the purpose they established it was to kind of support the, the non-existent rehabilitative programs in prison. It started out with providing sports equipment and music equipment, because what Ted had identified to be true was that there were, there were ways for people to, uh, to bridge that racial divide in prison 
and it was typically through athletics or music. So when Ted and I reconnected, it was time to think about how we could work together to, to add value to the community in which we were living. And the first thing we did was we found a way to create a platform to certify alcohol and other drug counselors in prison. So over the course of three years with crop support financial backing, we actually were able to certify 33 life term inmates as alcohol and other drug counselors. Uh, you know, it, it had never been done before. And we received some, some recognition from the Senate for our efforts. And of the, of the 33 men who went through our program and became certified, 25 have since paroled. All, we all had life and, and 25 have since paroled. 15 um, are currently working in the AOD field, alcohol and other drug counseling field. And none of them have recidivated. None of them have gone back to prison. So over the course of you know, the subsequent years, we continued with, with crop support to, to do good work in the community. We hosted uh, dozens of leadership seminars for college students at a local community college. We wrote a book called Men Built for Others, which was a compilation of transformational stories of men who were serving life in prison. And we also established a scholarship. We established a scholarship that has recently received a lot of press. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more into that. So we were a part of a book club uh, where a local private school was coming in and reading literature with the incarcerated population. And there was a story that was being sh shared about um, this uh, POW camp during the Korean conflict, I believe. And the culture inside of this POW camp was very much like the culture we had in, in prison. Very me, 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 very isolated, very uh, hateful. But there was a group of people in this prison camp who made a different decision. They made a decision to look out for each other. And what they called was to muck for one another. And they would do it by like, if, if, if I was mucking for Nikki per se, and he got ill, then he would get half of my rations. Or if he needed my, I would give him my blankets if needed. And one person in, in particular, he mucked so hard for his, the person that he was standing for that he himself died from the sacrifices he made. And when he did this, there was a fundamental transformation that occurred throughout the entire camp and everyone began looking out for one another. So when, when we heard this story, Ted, you know, who we'd already been working together for, for years inside now, he leaned over to me and he said, that's something we need to do, Jay. We need to start a scholarship and help a young man who's not financially capable to attend this amazing school. So for the next three years, we, we began a fundraising campaign with crop support and we raised over $32,000 in prison. Um, it doesn't sound like a big number to many people, but when you realize that in prison, we're only making eight cents an hour, uh, that's a lot of money. So, this time last year, or actually January 8th of last year, all of this effort and work that we did kind of came to a head because while I was still incarcerated, CNN, uh, or oh, sorry, two years, yeah, two years ago, CNN actually came in and had an episode uh, under for This Is Life with Lisa Ling called, and the episode is called uh, Prison and Prep School. And in it, I was featured uh, as they covered not only the book reading program, but the scholarship that we helped to establish. Um, I was featured largely because I was the last person of our leadership team that was still at that prison. And, uh, you know, as far as my personal accomplishments, uh, some people find it remarkable that I earned not only a bachelor's degree while incarcerated, but two master's degrees as well and my cert state certification. So all of that was kind of encapsulated within this story about the scholarship. Um, as a result of all of that work, both Ted and I were commuted by the governor of California on March 27th of last year. It was a, it was a rather exceptional uh, commutation because people who typically are, are, are serving time for crimes of our nature, if they are commuted, it's usually a reduction in sentence but they still go to the board. 
whereas the governor of California actually ordered our immediate release from prison. So now we're home. We, we're, we've been home since early April and we are part of the directorship of the crop organization. And these last nine or 10 months have been nothing short of uh, like blinding uh, as far as the work we've been doing. The crop organization is now focused on the reentry space. And we have identified four pillars for successful reentry when it comes to returning citizens from, pris from prison. And I just wanna say that, you know, on, on the front side, when we were inside, we were looking for solutions on how to have better rehabilitative programs and, and add value to the community inside and outside. And now that we're out, we've identified some big gaps in the way reentry services are being provided to returning citizens. Because the number one problem here in the States at the very least is recidivism, people going back to prison. So we've identified what we, like I said, uh, what we've, what we're calling the four pillars to successful reentry. And the first pillar starts with thinking. So we, we are in the process of uh, developing, uh, uh, getting some real estate for a campus where it's a year long program. And for the first three months, the, the participants will be engaged in personal leadership development and professional skills development. Things that most people who are in prison aren't exposed to, um, how to work in an, how to work effectively in a workspace with colleagues, uh, teamwork, you know, focus mastery, critical thinking. The next six months are spent in hard skill development. That's our second pillar, uh, helping people to get the skills or skilled up in marketable, market driven skills. And for us, our emphasis, uh, our focus right now is on tech. We're going to start with the B2B tech sales track. Yes, uh, right before this call, interestingly, just how fate would have it, I, I was on the phone with the vice president of Oracle. So we're in preliminary conversations with um, some pretty big names who are willing to support us and sponsor us in this work to help returning citizens enter into the tech space. Uh, we have a lot of great things happening, uh, not to mention that uh, last week I was on the phone with, uh, on a, a Zoom with Governor Newsom, and it seems that the state of California is willing to partner with us for the next three years on this pilot. So the, the and the, moving into the third pillar of successful reentry, which is employment. So one of the biggest problems for returning citizens is, is getting past the stigma that all you can be when you commit a crime is a criminal or somebody who works construction. You know, and nothing wrong with construction, but but we're in the business of creating possibilities for people and saying that there is potential if there, if if individuals are given opportunities. So uh, it's it's a it's a heavy lift for us to have those employer development conversations and show the value of our program participants to their organizations. And the final pillar, the fourth pillar of our our model for successful reentry, is housing, because once they complete the year long program of uh, you know, people need a place to live. And they, and oftentimes returning citizens because they have no rental history uh, and they have, you know, felonies on their records, they have experienced that difficulty, a similar difficulty in finding a stable place to live. So that's, that's the work we're engaged in now. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. I really don't have the words to, to convey how remarkable this has all been. Um, and the press that has come from it, I mean, you know, CNN was the start and it's, I, I would say that the, the pinnacle was that on January 1st of this year, President Obama uh, tweeted about our story. And, you know, that was remarkable. Uh, he's in our book that we wrote in 2016, you know, he's, he's one, of, uh, one of my idols, my mentors in, in so many ways that uh, I look up to his leadership. Um, and you know, since his tweet, the the the, the phone hasn't stopped ringing. <laughs> as far as people who are, at the very least, curious about our work, and and at the and, and at best, willing to to entertain the possibility of our model and support us in this effort to to help uh, you know really uh, impact the recidivism rate in California and put people to thrive in the community. So, that's kind of my story from A to Z and where we're at today. Amazing. Um, thank you so much for sharing, Jason. Thank you so much for not only sharing, but also doing what you're doing. I know about we, we talk, I had a conversation about the TEDx and the prison events. And mm -hmm. it's all, they, I also learned from them that the recidivism 
is this big issue that this rate has to go down because it basically the the standard is not that if they would go back or not, but how long it takes for sure. prisons to come back. So it's kind of taken for granted that a prisoner becomes back to being a prisoner. If you live 20 years in a prison, that turns into your home. As much right. as it sounds unusual and not comprehensible for us, or for me, you have experienced right. this. that was your home for 20 years. Yes. And, you know, one of my um, one of the books I read when I first was incarcerated uh, was Crime and Punishment. Fyodor Dostoevsky, and I, I, I find it instructive. One of the things that he he noted, you know, if if you want to judge a society, don't do it by how they treat their outstanding citizen. Do it by how they treat their criminals, right? And you know, I think that you have two sides of the conversation right now in the states. You have the the more liberal left, who's like, yes, these are human beings, and they need to be once they you know serve their time and it, when they're truly transformed and, and rehabilitated they need to be reintegrated into the community and then you have the right side who doesn't necessarily hold that perspective but the conservatives typically have the idea that you know this doesn't make sense financially you know it's it costs eighty thousand dollars a year to incarcerate one person and we have over a hundred thousand people incarcerated in california um I mean, you could spend half of that on rehabilitating them, which they don't. They only spend about 5% of that on rehabilitation and then ensure they don't go back to prison, right? So it makes sense. This is one of the, the bipartisan issues in the states that actually makes sense, prison reform. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's exciting to kind of be at the vanguard of like what rehabilitation and what restoration in the community should look like. I'll always remember Brian Stevenson and Ted when he said, "Keep an eye, keep your eyes on the price, and we're all better than the worst thing that we've done." Sure. Um, I'm opening it up to everyone. Unmute yourself. Be part of the conversation. Share what you think. What your thoughts are. What's your vision, Jason? Well, my vision is to work myself out of a job. That's Crop's vision. We, we envision a world where there are no prisons. I mean, that might be super idealistic, but we know that if you give people opportunities and create a space as a community for them to succeed, that nine times out of 10, they'll take it. Um, and it just seems that, you know, there's obviously there's here in the States, there's a systemic issue with racism and, and, and a perspective of prison's purpose being aligned with punishment. Uh, but we think there's so much more available, uh, so it's exciting to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jason, if I may, so I'm Marcus in London. Okay. Um, and I do a lot of work with young boys, especially, but also girls who are just at that moment when they think the world sucks, everybody sucks. I'm gonna be in it for myself because I've got nothing. And it's very easy for them to lose confidence and go on, I suppose, the side of what you'd say is petty crime mm -hmm. which tends to develop. It, from your amazing, extraordinary experience, I salute you for everything which you've done, Jason. Um, and there's so much which I'd like to ask you about how you would spot those signs and what you can do to actually make society not get outliers although we're always going to have outliers. Sure. How, what sort of questions do you ask a young, a young guy who might be 14, 15, right. getting a bit rebellious? Just right. say, whoa, you know, <laughs> because what, what, adv excuse me, what advice would you give them to, to see if they could not do that? So that's an, that's an interesting question, Marcus. And I don't know if I have the right answer, but I can, I can share with you this. When we worked to establish that scholarship, you know, there were already a lot of groups who were doing good fundraising work and giving charitably. So when we approach, initially approached the population about, you know, raising so much money for one individual, there was some pushback. Like, like why would we raise $30,000 for one kid when we could, you know, buy backpacks for, for a thousand kids or whatever the case may be. Right. And our answer was this, Marcus, 
is that there's two different ways to look at helping people or standing people, standing for people. One is by digging an inch deep and going a mile wide. Yeah. And the other is by digging an inch wide and going a mile deep. So for, and I know that seems like a, maybe a little mysterious in some ways about like the answer to your question, but if, if, a, if a young man or a young lady is, is showing signs of going the wrong way, I would ask you, how deeply are you diving into them? Like how much time are you willing to spend with them? How much time are you willing to help them get clear on where they're going in the future? And it's, that's not always a practical answer. I mean, there's so many, as you say, outliers in the world, you know, and there's only so many hours in a day. Uh, but that's, that's really the, I mean, I think Mark went, he was talking about, you know, helping people establish their vision for the future, right? Like, that's the conversation we had with the young man who we uh, raised the scholarship for. We had a, a group of 10 to 20 guys once a week, sometimes uh, in a room with him, helping him get clear about his duties as a son, his duties as a student, and his vision for his future. So... Those are kind of my thoughts on, 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 on how to stand for someone in their teens uh, and help them get clear. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you still must uh, appreciate the fact that they, they have the freedom to choose. Yeah. How did you sell this to the warden? How did I sell it to the warden? Well, what, the scholarship or? Day the... one, the initiative, your day one thoughts, kind of being part of this or doing this. Well, when we first started working together in, inside, um, we had a lot of no's. Like there, was, there were people who were saying, it's impossible for you to start an alcohol and other drug certification program. You don't have you know, the support, you don't have uh, the supervision. And you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of the time out here, since we've been free, we've been hearing some no's too, like, though, that's not possible. It's not feasible. It costs too much to, to create the model that you're proposing. Uh, but, you know, we look for solutions, not, not problems. So it, the, whatever resistance we, we encountered when we first began uh, our work inside, uh, we continued to push forward. And eventually, kind of like a flywheel, people started to, to catch the vision and the support came. Uh, so it wasn't like one initial conversation, Nikki, to answer your question. It was like uh, continued grinding out and commitment to the mission, commitment to the vision that was so much bigger than any one of our personal uh, desires. Because it's very innovative and I guess the prison is not a place where innovation is embraced. No, well, no, it certainly wasn't in the early 2000s. <laughs> certainly not. Incredible. I'd like to ask you about the inner moment when you shifted into the posture of creating this program. Mm. I'm curious about what was happening for you. Like when people talk about this thing called the dark night of the soul, mm -hmm. like there's this moment that's hopelessness and then something happens and then there's this turn towards the hope and the aspiration. And I would like to describe if you, if there was like a point in time where you remember where you were like, I'm going to make a difference. So there, there actually was for me, um, like I said, my first 10, 10 years, like my 20 years of incarceration are really a tale of two cities in the sense that my first 10 years, it was all about me. And the last 10 years, it was all about we. And I came to that realization when Ted and I reconnected. He approached me with a, uh, a friend of his who were thinking about how they could start some type of program for, for counselors. And up until that point, you know, I had some some lingering resentments from the fact that, you know, the last time we were together, you know, someone was murdered and we're sitting here with life in prison. I don't know if I want to work with you again. Um, but I also had in my mind this idea that I was doing pretty good. You know, I was like, you know, six units away from my bachelor's degree in, in, a, in a space where most people didn't have their, their high school diploma. So I had this, you know, this arrogance like, oh, you know, I'm doing pretty good. But I actually read a poem, um, you know, as, as I was having these conversations with Ted, I was reading this, this, this poem by John Donne, uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And something about that poem really stuck in my craw, because um, basically what it's about, it's about our, our shared fate as human beings, right? Uh, one of the lines is like, ask not for whom the bell tolls. It, 
it tolls for thee. And in that moment, I kind of had this like this vague, it was starting to get clear understanding that, you know, the, the idea that I only needed to worry about me or, or, or take care of myself was exactly why I brought so much pain to my family in the first place. I wasn't considering how my actions and choices affected the people I loved. And in a, in a more broader sense, even though I had been doing a pretty good job for my first 10 years of incarceration, I was still in prison and everyone around me was wearing the same clothes as me. So at that point in time, I kind of had this like little light bulb go off like, and I realized that I had a responsibility to take whatever talents I had and share it with my community. And that's when I decided to go to the WE conversation and work with Ted and a team of, a team of leaders to bring programs to the community inside and out. Um, Chase, may I ask you um, two things? So one is quite personal and it's okay if you don't want to answer this. The, the other one is more superficial. Uh, I, listening to you, I mean, this is an incredible story, you know, coming home now, uh, I was expecting something completely different. It's called Silicon Valley Inspiration Tours. And then you share this story. It's, yeah, I have no words for that. Uh, but you seem to be very calm and very, very, let's say, okay with everything that happens, uh, that happened. So uh, how do you feel about those 20 years and what are the emotions when you think back? And this second thing um, is, I mean, you have spent the last 20 years in prison, uh, probably the most exciting, not probably, definitely the most exciting years in terms of human development. How was it for you? Like, it, it must be like, I don't know, traveling to the future or something. What, what, what were, what, what's your experience? What, what did you think when you came out? So, okay. That's, that's a two-part answer. And I'll say this. My 20s, I spent all my 20s, all my 30s um, in prison. And the one thing I'll say about prison is it's nothing to write home about. The, the days blend in ways that are so beyond monotony, like the same pattern like here's the bell for chow here's the bell to lock up here's the bell for yard here's the bell for work and school here's the bell for lock up right that you know really the two decades I spent in prison are largely a blend of of one experience and that's sad I mean there were obviously highlights there were there were accomplishments and there were you know successes and many victories which highlight and contextualize the experience. There were friendships. You know, we played sports. The same leadership team that I built programs with, we had a softball team and there were great moments. But by and large, like I said, the experience of prison is nothing to write home about. That said, it's it's also an experience that I will never forget because it's where some of it's where I became a man, for one. It's also where the most important relationships of my life were formed. Because what I haven't shared with you guys is that in 2011, my high school sweetheart came back into my life. And we got married two years later. In 2017, the governor at the time, Governor Jerry Brown, decided that lifetime inmates had the same right to conjugal visits that every other inmate had. Because we didn't have them prior to that. There were no conjugal visits for lifetime inmates. So in 2019, my son was born. I was still incarcerated. And in 2020, uh, a mere four months before I was released, my second son was conceived. So talking about like the, the difficulty in, in 2019, February, my son was born on January 11th. February 9th was the first first time that I actually got to hold him. And it was in that moment when I looked into his eyes uh, that I got two things. The first thing I got was I finally understood why my parents loved me so much unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Like it made sense to me. Like up until that point, I'd never got it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much an F up for the most part. Uh, every opportunity you gave me, I squandered, but you still love me. But in that moment, I understood why. But the other thing that I understood was that I had to get out of prison. I mean, up until that point, it was like time was hard in a sense, but it didn't really get hard until I looked at my son and, and saw this, you know, beautiful 
beautiful child who needed me and deserved me in his life. Um, so that being said, me, me coming home, me coming home, you know, my wife is an incredible woman who has done an amazing job on her own and, and really had a, I want to say a turnkey life ready for me. Uh, all I'm doing is adding value to something miraculous that she's already created. I think you need silence to process. <laughs> the Jason, How did your son. Sorry, now go ahead. No, it was it was, good. Well, it was a slightly different uh, topic. So if you wanted to follow up, uh, Nikki, that's fine. I was. I'm curious how your son, because he's conscious about your story. Mm -hmm. response on your work and you, you as a personality well let me see if i can show you this picture if i can get this off the screen uh i mean my son is he's, he just turned two jackson is two and tristan is five months old so they're they're they know things are going on but i i don't know if they can put it in words really um here they are. I want to show you guys the picture. There they are. Um, and you know, in spite of you know all these amazing blessings and opportunities with uh, you know freedom, uh, contributing to great press, uh, the work in in reentry, uh, they all of it comes second to being home with them. Uh, so, I mean, the best part of my day is when I pick up my two-year-old from daycare. Niall, yeah. Niall, go ahead. Yeah, it was, um, well, first of all, it made me re it's made me realize this last 45 minutes, Jason, that I've overused the word inspiring very often because, uh, you know, that word doesn't do justice to what you just shared. So thank you sincerely for that. Um, and it, it, am I, I was just very interested in, you, you mentioned you've got your, your, ma your two masters, and yes. your bachelors, uh, bachelors. Mm -hmm. are they linked and 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 they're, they're totally different to completely theme? unrelated i have i have a bachelor's degree in business administration and i have a, a master of arts in philosophy and a master of science in psychology okay because <laughs> nice. i'm all over the place <laughs> well uh, you know they're not direct obviously linked but i think there's some interesting sure. because it's a very regular like, prison career <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to say that I have a, a, ma a master's degree in possibility and a master's degree in probability. <laughs> but yeah, you, you I, 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 impossibility. <laughs> <laughs> My sort of uh, question really behind that was um, how much of that has been influencing your, your thinking, the work you've been doing on the scholarship, the, the, the initiatives that you've set off with, and also what you've been doing since you've come out of uh, prison as well? I mean, has so, it really helped? Well, absolutely. I mean, my, my thesis for my first master's degree in my first love, which is philosophy, was on the leadership work. Uh, it was on phenomenology, a branch of philosophy called phenomenology. And it was about the actual leadership work that we were doing in prison. So mm -hmm. that, that work, that foundation of personal responsibility and the value of, you know, really owning that empowered mindset uh, is is going to be continued in the work that we do out here like that's the that's literally the first pillar of our program is is that conversation um and as far as the psychology degree i mean i am a, a certified counselor and my my position uh with the crop organization is director of re restorative programs so uh you know it's important for me to understand uh, the ins and outs of the way people think for the most part sure uh, yeah. a, a clear foundation and you know you, you clearly built on that fantastically Wow. Jason, I have a very profane question, but I'm serious with it. How can people like us support and help? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing, in my opinion, is, is conversations like these. Conversations that kind of blow open the possibility of what it means for people who have made this <laughs> and, and the value that they might be able to add uh, to the community. Um, that's that's the, the, the lowest hanging fruit for that answer, Nikki, is just continuing to stimulate the, the conversation about possibilities for people. Yeah. Um, because there's there's so many who have such a marginalized view of people who made poor choices like I did. And, and that really 
cuts off our access to see their potential, I think. Um, so that's that's first and foremost. I mean, secondly, you could always visit our website and or, or email me. And if you have any ideas about collaboration, uh, because it, it takes all of us. I mean, literally our tagline is working together to restore lives. So <clears throat> pop those things in the chat so we can uh, copy Absolutely. and paste them. Absolutely. I have a question for you um, as well while you're doing that. Okay. Clearly you at 42 or wherever you're at, 40-ish, mm -hmm. you okay. have come through this crucible in your life and you've rendered into your life this amazing contribution to humanity, the we. And I'm wondering if you will allow yourself to feel any more uh, individual aspirations in terms of wealth creation and the personal empowerment of bringing your family into greater and greater sense of abundance and resourced stat stasis uh, uh, beyond just the work you're doing. And have you thought about, looked into, do you have a sense of your future? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I am a, a future-based thinker. So we have some very concrete visions as an organization. Personally, um, you know, the most important thing for me in the world is to add value to my son's lives and my wife. Um, so I want to be, I'm going to be uh, the best dad I can possibly be, the best husband I can possibly be. Um, as far as my personal growth and development, you know, I, when I'm at my best, I stay with a, a student's mindset and, you know, I, I, mind. yeah, there you go. And I'd love to see myself in my sixties back in school. Uh, going after a PhD and writing a dissertation about this this whole experience. Wow. Um, I had part of my career where I worked for a company called Zabo. And Zabo was the food service provider for the Sonoma County Jail. Okay. And so I spent 18 months of my life um, working with inmates in an environment where I had to figure out who I could give pe potato peelers to and knives to and interacting with that kind of consciousness. And so for me, during your sharing, your offering today, I was taken back to the relationships I had there and the heartfelt connection I felt for these guys and the, the, the challenging cognitive dissonance that showed up as I both connected with them and then also encountered my judgments of them for the fact of where they were in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to move beyond that mental framework and stop projecting onto people that we see who have been incarcerated, the mindset of they're wrong or that they're not valuable or those sorts of things. And so mm -hmm this was a reminder for me of our common humanity, no matter what our circumstances, even self-inflicted consequences of the nature that you described and how much better world it will be when we can break free of the judgments that we have and really f stay in the present moment, as your father said to you, and be with the possibilities, be with the, the human potential in the moment. And uh, the reason I asked you the question about the upside for you personally is that I can see you doing the work for creating a better humanity. And I, I just wanted to put the possibility that it's okay for you to create wealth in your life. That in fact, it's another example for people in your field and who have experienced what you've experienced to see value in themselves and to see a high upside. Like there's no reason that you can't have that kind of experience as well and channel it in. Like one of my goals financially is to begin to create microloans for Africa, right? And so that's in my actual financial vision for myself. And the level you've committed to is like way beyond what I imagined for myself. And so now I'm feeling the sense of, all right, can I challenge myself to even go beyond microloans? Like, and I'm just gonna say it, we're at the age where people who are in my racial identity group have to begin to face the idea of what reparations looks like. Mm. And there's this massive idea of what that is. But when you break it down to what can I do, it becomes a much more solvable 
question. And so I'm starting to examine through the lens of what you've achieved, this idea of how can I give back specifically around issues of BIPOC and underserved communities. And there's some pressure and wetness in my eyes right now. And I feel this elevated sense of um, excitement and emotional state around having heard what you said and feeling inspired about what you've done. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. I hope we say at the men's, men's family, men's group. Thank you for sharing that with us, Mark. So your son. Yeah. Oh, you can hear him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got it right now. Perfect. Moment. Uh, Jason, if I may um, ask you something. Um, first of all, um, <clears throat> thank, <clears throat> thank you for this uh, uh, story. Very inspirational. and. Um, you know, I'm part of Rotary. We are an organization also involved in some of projects which are uh, related. So I, I'm going to contact you after. I just want to share you a bit of my personal story with, which is a bit related. So uh, when I was young, you know, back there in Romania, every day when I went to school, actually um, that road from my home to school was also a meeting the prison. So the prison of the, in the city. Uh, I mean, in the town, it was not really a big city. So every morning, you know, my mother was taking me to school and, um, you know, of course, uh, I saw the prison. So I was always asking her questions, you know, like, who are those people? What is happening there? And I remember, you know, I mean, it was either my mother or my father taking me to school. So we used to walk because the distance was like, you know, two kilometers, nice morning and afternoon back home. Uh, the feedback I, I got was really that, oh, you need to be careful, never approach that building, you know, stay away. Um, I'm realizing over the years that actually this has to change, right? Uh, how do we change, you know, the, this role of the prison in society that it, it is not, you know, it, it is like, you know, a, a school for me. It, we have to change, right, this kind of and, and it has to start at a very young age, I guess. How can we educate? How can we kind of, you know, um, uh, transmit a different vision of this institution? Um, what would you do differently, you know, uh, so that um, society gives a better chance, receives better people who are, you know, out of prison and, and allow them, a, you know, give them a second chance, you know, in may, maybe a more scalable way, maybe a more receiving inclusive way. So I, as, as you're asking that question, Johan, I'm thinking about uh, a story that was told to me once. And there was, there's a guy who, he was curious about how they did prison in other countries. And he, he took a trip to Africa and you know, I, I don't remember which country in Africa, but he asked them like how they viewed their prisoners. And the response was that, uh, you know, in their dialect, in their language, they didn't have the word prisoner. Like they said was, you know, these are, these are our, our brothers. These are our sisters. These are our fellow Africans. And, you know, they made choices that were harmful, but it's our job to get them home. I mean, that's what our job is to get them home. And then he took a trip to, I think it was Germany. Um, and, and in Germany, he asked some of the prison administrators, you know, because the, 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 the living conditions in German prisons are so much different than here in the States. It's, you know, they're, they're very nice for all intents. They're like studio apartments. And, and he asked them, he said, how do you justify treating your incarcerated population this way? And the answer was that, you know, these are German citizens. And while they did make poor choices, there's something going on in our society that made that type of behavior acceptable. So therefore, we have a responsibility to re-educate and reintegrate. You know, over here in the States, you know, I talked a little bit about the systemic racism. It's true. The extension of Jim Crow slavery over here in America um, and the punishment model that has been used for so long. You know, the origins may be race, Maybe I'm I, I'm I would I'm sure there's some people who would would assert that that is how it started, 
But now today we have an opportunity to redefine, to redefine what it means. And, and to, to, because there is a distinction, they're interrelated, but there is a distinction between personal responsibility, which is you know, the offender or the incarcerated person's willingness to accept that, hey, what I did was wrong and I wanna change my life and systemic or societal responsibility to say, hey, our job is to create a context for you to figure it out and then welcome you back when you do.